Let me start with the first topic, distributed computing. So, distributed computing is the field in computer science that studies distributed systems. So here we have to understand two parts of it. What does distributed mean? And what does system mean? By system, we mean a computer system. So anything related to computer science, basically, that works together to compute some kind of output. Distributed means a system which components are located on different net somehow network computers. Right? So you have those systems that are connected together using some kind of network. Network could also mean a wireless network, 3G, 5, 4G, 5G, what have you, but also mean really to be a physical cable. So these components that you then have, that this computer system is comprised of, they communicate and coordinate together by exchanging some kind of messages. And they do this in order to achieve a common goal. Right? So there is an, a very broad definition of distributed systems as well, where you can say that you have an autonomous processes in the operating system perspective that are coordinated by passing messages. So the characteristics of a distributed system are that they have a distributed memory. That means each component has their own private memory that no other component can look into. It's a little bit like you and the class of students. Right? You have your own memory, your brain and your thoughts and all your memories and another student has. But you can communicate. Right? So you could say that you form kind of a distributed team right? where you work together to achieve a goal. May it be as simple as just passing this module. Well, um, a second characteristic is the concurrency of components. So the different components, they are supposed to compute at the same time. Again, you can think of two people and they do a task at the same time. Independent of each other was, was our first characteristic that is distributed, sort of. But now they are concurrently. Concurrency means really doing things at the same time. So another aspect is a lack of a global clock. So um, that means that each of them, the systems that, that are contributing to this um, distributed system, uh, may have a different clock. So when each of them looks at the clock, you may not say what, which one comes first, right? So I know if we humans look on a clock, we can both say it's now 11.30, right? And that's not a problem for a machine either, but we are talking here about a, a precision in terms of nanoseconds, right? And when you, when you go down to that precision, it's really difficult uh, to say uh, which event comes really first. Because if you look at your clock, one clock might be a little bit different, so it might diverge from the absolute clock of another one, even if you use GPS clocks and such, right? So we cannot assume that something that happens hap comes first than something else, like a message. So clocks, remember clocks are possible, possibly. Okay, last aspect is that you have these distributed systems that consist of many components. And if you have multiple components, a problem might be that they may fail. And we can assume that failure in a distributed system is kind of the normal situation, because we are talking here really about possibly thousands of components, and it's very likely that one of them fails at a time, right? Like the internet fails from time to time as well in your household. So let me give you an example distributed program and an example distributed system, how we could sketch that. And if you go back to the learning objectives, you would see that one part of the learning objectives would really to understand and being able to draw such a very tiny figure. So we have a distributed program that runs on such a distributed system, right? So how does the distributed system look like? So here on the left side from the hardware, well, we said we have different computer systems. Well, we have one computer, two computers, three computers here that are somehow connected using a network, right? Indicated here, connected by those little links, 
right? And what is a computer about, right? A computer has a, typically a, a CPU, a processor. It has some kind of memory because we are talking about a von Neumann machine. And it may have some spe specific hardware, extra hardware that is unique to this computer, okay? So now we have this system easily sketched like this. And now we want to run a distributed program on it. So we talk about the software perspective. So the software perspective is mapped to the hardware. So we may have, for instance, um, program one and program two that are running on the exact same computer here and they communicate with each other exchanging messages. So they just communicate, right? And physically they are represented by, or logically by some kind of operating system process. So they have their own memory where they only they have access isolated from another process in program two. So they exchange messages here, but also we have another program four here that runs on a totally different computer, which has also some process. And those three programs, program one, program two, and program four, they work together to achieve a goal, whatever goal that might be, right? In this same distributed system that we have, there might be another program, program three, that may have two processes somewhat running on another computer, okay? So processes, there are instances of a program running on one specific computer. We talk, I mean by process really the operating system process. And we could think of that a distributed application and algorithm may run, involve this different various potentially um, vendors of software. So you could imagine program four was another you know, was not produced by one software vendor, but from another one, and it interacts with program two somehow using a standard way of communication, right? Like for instance, your web browser interacts somehow with the internet and internet servers in a standardized way. And same in the hardware, right? You could have a hardware environment where you have different computer systems that are produced by different vendors. Okay, let me show a couple of further um, examples of applications and algorithms. So the internet is, like I mentioned before, is a really a great example of a distributed system. Telecommunication networks as well. We have cloud computing. We'll talk about this a bit later. Wireless sensor networks and the internet of things. What, does it, what is the internet of things? Well, it actually means everything is connected somehow to the internet, even your fridge <laughs> or your uh, I don't know, printer, car, what have you, right? So it's in connecting everything together. Short IoT, Internet of Things. So um, we'll talk later a bit more about algorithms, but here is a short um, selection of algorithms. Um, so we have, for example, consensus. So when you have to make a reliable agreement on a decision, this is a distributed algorithm, right? And you can think, what does this mean in real world? Well. For example, an election, right? In real world means that you have to reliably come to a decision, a joint decision, how many percent of people voters vote for which candidate, right? Um, and that is a, a form of consensus. And you have to deal with malicious partic participants pot potentially, right? That try to give a fake wrong information into the system. Electing a leader is one to broadcast a message reliably that, such that everyone can really receive it despite all those common failures that I mentioned that happen in a distributed system. So the network can go down, a, a, a server, a computer system can break and replication is another typical algorithm. So when you have one kind of data and you want to make sure that this data is replicated across multiple systems. So now we have the term of cloud computing. What is cloud computing? It's the on-demand availability of computer system resources. Like what are resources here? Data storage and computing. And this is the, the, the big idea in the past was like, like power that comes out of the wall socket. Here you have computing, right? Cloud makes it possible to have computing on demand and storage on demand. Well, without direct active management by the users, right? Very easy, very convenient. So this, what does cloud computing mean? Well, we have three 
levels of cloud computing typically. We have an infrastructure as a service, which means that you get some hardware, physical hardware, being made allocated to you such that you can use it, like a computing system and network and so on. The next system is the next level of abstraction that cloud computing came up with is a platform. So you get like it, you know, an environment where software and hardware already works together to achieve a goal, like a database, for example, right? A database is a piece of software that runs on infrastructure, but you can have that as a platform to develop further software. And finally, you have on the high level, you have applications like Gmail, for instance, um, Office 365, cloud computer applications that run on a platform on an infrastructure. And all those levels of abstraction, you can sort of pay money to get those resources on demand. Right? You can get certain applications, you can get certain platforms, depending on how much you pay, and certain infrastructures. Okay, so what does cloud computing also mean? Well, it means that you get those resources, distributed resources, that are provided by data centers across the globe, and it somehow, as a user, you not necessarily have to know where these resources come from, right? Like power, you don't care necessarily if it comes from a nuclear power plant or if it comes from a coal power plant, right? So um, these data centers provide then resources to many users over the internet somehow and ultimately to you if you are an end user that uses an application or if you hire platforms or infrastructures, right? There's also the term for a couple of years now that has been coined as fog and edge computing. Right, you can think of cloud, right? Cloud is the big thing but that everything is in that is somehow connected to the internet. But what is now a fork, right? A fork is a small, I'd say, cloud. A fork is closer to the user, to the end user, right? Like you have a very local data center, a small data center, that then is really um, helping to support you with your computation needs. And by having resources closer, you have some performance advantages, right? and possibly also privacy advantages, right? And edge finally means that's a connection between the, uh, so I would say, some normal, uh, smaller distributed computing system with the cloud computing environment, okay? So it brings basically something that isn't really well connected to cloud into the cloud. Okay, in terms of applications, I mentioned already Google Mail, Dropbox is another one, right? And you can think of an application like Dropbox Dropbox is um, kind of like you can this is a, a content, possibly a content uh, application that uses object storage that somehow or ultimately needs some block storage under the hood, right? So you have application platforms and infrastructure involved. And infrastructure you can nowadays get from a couple of vendors here, are really uh, prominent ones. Amazon, you have uh, Google, you have Microsoft Azure, and you have Oracle Cloud as well. So let me give you some facts for cloud computing and data centers. So um, because these numbers are really, really huge and I'm really amazed by them. Okay, so if you think about server workloads in that could be specific workload, right, like serving a web server, something like that, there are about 350 millions of those workloads somehow executed at the moment. And about 10 of those workloads are, are executed of each physical server. That means a lot of servers, right? Data centers provide a storage capacity of about 1750 exabyte, an exabyte is 10 to the power of 18, right? Of bytes capacity. And you know that your SSD or hard disk drive that you have has a couple of terabytes. So that means, this basi basically means it's about 1 million hard disk drives or SSDs that are out there. And they have stored, uh, they had stored at the time, um, I think about 2017, about 720 exabytes have been stored. And 180 exabytes were actually of big data projects. Okay. So the global data center net internet protocol traffic 
was about 14 zettabyte and about 440 terabytes a second, right? I wished my Virgin Media would be able to get such a throughput. Um, yeah. Okay. 15% of this volume is actually communicated to the user. That means about 20 kilobytes per second per human is the amount of data that you would get in average, right? Every human on the planet would have gotten 20 kilobytes a second sustained. That's actually, while it looks like so few data, it's a lot if you multiply it with the hour and you know the number of days a year. Okay, the power consumption of, of the data center is becoming more and more a problem. So US data centers have about 40% UK energy consumption, okay? Or 3% of the global energy. So the energy bill would for this 416 terawatt would be about 40 billion pounds. So in 2025, it's estimated that about 20% of the global energy consumption is consumed by data centers. So computing is important. Distributed computing is a key driver in this. Don't forget that. So in distributed computing, we have a set of challenges. First of all, programming. When you have to think in parallel, what happens is that you make different types of mistakes. So we have concurrent processes that execute operations at the same time. And it's really difficult to think of what could happen and how those things could kind of be interlocked, those activities. And you must coordinate between the program somehow, like we coordinate when we talk to each other as humans. Another problem is that you have no global view and it, debugging is really hard. So no global view means you can't just look and say, oh, I look at this system consisting of 1000 servers and I want to see what all of them have in memory. That's a, a, a really a big task, really hard for humans to debug. Also, it's expensive to debug, by the way. Okay, next challenge is resource sharing. So these systems, they share the resources between all the users, which makes it somehow difficult to, dis to, dis to identify what's going on on the system, but, but also it makes it difficult to account resources to users and to isolate issues. Okay, next thing, scalability. Okay, somehow we want in a distributed system that we are able to grow with the requirements in terms of performance, capacity and so on, and resources needed. So you want to grow the numbers of users served, the number of data volume that you can host and the computing demand while providing the same performance level or roughly the same response time to the individual users. So in that sense, how can you do that? Well, you can only do that to add by adding hardware and possibly to do that live, right? While the system runs, you add further and further hardware. So the next challenge is fault handling. As we said, faults are basically the norm in a distributed system. So you have to detect, mask and recover from failures. And they are really inevitable to have errors and they are the normal mode of operation. So you must program to really account for errors. Heterogeneity. So you have a system that consists of different hardware and software. Transparency. So users should not care about how, where the code and data is. Security. Well, availability of services and the confidentiality of data are really important. Let me go now to parallel computing. 